We're, yes, we're going to record this for those folks who can't make it. So welcome to A Sip of Science. This is our second uh, uh, a visit this year. And um, just for those of you who are new to SIP of Science, this is uh, uh, folks from the Biodesign Institute and from Arizona State University who are um, doing interesting science. And it's an opportunity for them to kind of present that to the public and give everybody an idea of what's, you know, all the exciting science that's going on here in ASU. Uh, with an opportunity to really, we really keep the talks on the short side so that there's a lot of time for questions and answer because what we found in the past is that uh, people like to have a dialogue, they like to have a conversation. And uh, the goal here is really to you know, share information. So maybe we can uh, advance the slide. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you can click um, over, your, over your name and rename it to, to change it to your name if you don't have, if your name isn't showing. And that way we you know, we know who you are um, so we can chat. Um, we're gonna keep people muted during the presentation uh, just so that uh, it doesn't get chaotic. But if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little um, chat function, which you can see illustrated with the green box down there. And please feel free to type any questions you have into that chat box. And then um, at the end, we'll, we'll be doing questions and answers. And I think we're hoping that maybe we can even just have people you know, verbally ask their questions. But if you put them in the chat, we'll know to call on you. So that would be terrific. Um, Tia Parker will be the one who's going to read over the, the, the questions. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. So just very briefly, for those of you who are also new to the Biodesign Institute, we are the premier research institute at Arizona State University. Uh, our institute was created really at the turn of the century with the notion of solving problems in the world. So our research is intended to be what we call translational. It really is directed at, at fixing things, if you will. Um, we have a broad remit, so we work on everything from, you know, saving the planet and, and, and uh, sustainability to human health, to human security, to cybersecurity, so broad uh, range of activities. We take, we take our research inspiration from nature, and we're organized into centers. Each center is focused on addressing some challenge facing um, humanity or the planet. And uh, of course, within the center, we often have faculty members from many different disciplines. Uh, it's typical to find people from multiple colleges, multiple departments in the same center, all with the notion of working together to, to solve things. Um, it's been a crazy year. I think, you know, Pete kind of mentioned that a moment ago um, <clears throat> with, the, with the outbreak of COVID-19, you know, all of us have had to, you know, squirrel away in our, in our homes. Although a lot of the folks at Biodesign uh, came out and started working on developing a, a saliva test for the virus. Uh, that test has now become one of the largest testers in the state of Arizona. We've now tested over 700,000 uh, tests in the state so far, uh, free public testing. And, and have, of course, ASU now, you, many of you know, is very actively engaged in delivering vaccines now and um, run two of the most prolific sites uh, in the state for delivering vaccines, over 12,000 in a day. So um, we've been busy, um, but um, today we're here to talk about um, an area completely unrelated uh, to COVID-19. So let's see if we can get the next slide here. Oh, um, I'm, I guess I'm supposed to remember, remind you that, that Sip of Science won an award from, was it Phoenix Magazine? Yeah, Phoenix Magazine uh, awarded Sip of Science uh, uh, one of the best places to catch a drink and learn something at the same time. So. Uh, we're, we're proud of that. Okay, so we'll go back to the today's speaker, um, whom I've known for many years. I knew him when I was still in Boston. We did a project together years and years ago, uh, and um, I'm especially proud because he was my first hire here at, at um, ASU. Um, he's a world-famous researcher in the field of virology, um, so uh, knows everything that there is to know about viruses, as well as um, how viruses can affect the immune system and um, how, how it can be deployed in very interesting ways, which you're about to hear about. But he's been um, leaders of the virology societies. He's been editor in chief of uh, one of the leading virology magazines and now is an editor for molecular, molecular therapy oncolytics. Um, uh, runs a really fascinating center in biodesign uh, related to immunotherapy, vaccines and virotherapy. And I'm not gonna take any more of his time. I'm gonna introduce you to uh, uh, Dr. Grant McFadden. 
Okay, well, thanks, Josh. Um, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to meet all of your electrons. Uh, I wish we were in person uh, at a pub, maybe, uh, but I've decided to celebrate myself. I'm actually going to have a beer with you. This is the beer that I'm having. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's bunny beer. And I'm gonna try and explain to you today why that's the coolest beer on the planet uh, and why uh, bunnies uh, can be neat. So um, I, as Josh mentioned, I'm a virologist. Uh, I'm fascinated by viruses and uh, I've devoted my professional life to studying them. And up until last year, I studied a virus that I'm gonna to describe tonight uh, that infects only bunnies. Uh, but in the past year, like so many people, so many scientists, I've also been engaged in the fight against COVID. And I'll, I'll briefly describe how that happened and kind of where we are right now. So why don't we put the first slide on and uh, let me start by introducing my gang. Um, this is uh, my lab. Actually, this is my lab up until COVID struck. And then, um, since then, a number of people have moved on and the names that you see in red here have actually joined a company called Oncomix. Uh, and I'm gonna to describe today uh, how um, the work in our lab ended up with a spin-off biotech company here in Phoenix and kind of what it does compared to what my lab does. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a number of things about viruses, but I'm going to start off by talking about how viruses can be used to treat disease, and in this case, cancer. So I'm sure all of you know cancer. All of you uh, either have been either touched by it or you know someone who's been touched by it. Um, it is still a major health problem. Um, many of you probably know that um, if you're to get cancer, there's three different methods, strategies, therapies that are used, namely chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. These have been developed over many years. Uh, this is what oncologists do to try and um, treat cancer patients. But when you think about it, or if you've experienced it, you know that poisoning, burning, and cutting is very invasive. Uh, very hard on a person, uh, very harsh, and uh, new methods, new treatments are being sought all of the time. And at the bottom of the slide, you see three of the new treatments that are coming down the pike uh, to hopefully one day replace chemo, radiation, and surgery. And those are immunotherapy, cell therapy, and at the bottom right, virotherapy. And virotherapy is kind of what I do in my lab. It's a, a field that uh, my lab is, is in, and it's called oncolytic virotherapy. And I'll kind of describe that to you. But many of you might have heard of immunotherapy. Um, it is uh, a new technology um, that is being used to treat cancer. It was used, uh, some of you may have been familiar with uh, Jimmy Carter's cancer, which was terminal. He, he, uh, and. It was, it was immunotherapy that actually saved his life. So um, immunotherapy is going to get larger and larger on the scale of the landscape of cancer therapy. And we're hoping that virotherapy is gonna join it as one of the major treatment modalities for cancer. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into it and, and kind of where we hope it's going. So next slide. So this uh, is where the bunny came from. This is the European rabbit. Its Latin name is Orctologus caniculus. Um, it is a lagomorph uh, and it evolved in Europe, in Southern Europe, in the Iberian Peninsula. And it would have remained there were it not for humankind, men, uh, in ships who brought it around the world. And um, I became interested in this animal, the European rabbit, um, in part because uh, the virus that we study in our lab, it, the virus is called myxoma virus. This virus is trapped in rabbits. It can't get out of them. 
Um, and uh, it cannot infect people, it cannot infect mice, it cannot infect kangaroos, uh, it can't infect anything but a rabbit. And biologically, it's trapped in rabbits. And it's spread from rabbit to rabbit by biting mosquitoes. And those mosquitoes can bite anything, but unless it's a rabbit, the virus dies. It can't exist in anything but a European rabbit. And I became very interested scientifically in why this virus was trapped in rabbits and why is it so dangerous to rabbits? Um, this virus is about 99.9% .9 lethal to European rabbits, but to nothing else. And I studied for many years the, the scientific issues as to why is this virus so rabbit specific? And also, why is it harmless to people? And why is it harmless to mice? And uh, one of the other reasons I became fascinated by this animal and by this virus is I mentioned that the, uh, the rabbit has traveled around the world with Western man. And one of the places the rabbit landed was in Australia. And it landed there about 150 years ago. And what it found was a new habitat uh, where it had lots to eat, but no natural predators. And so guess what it did? It grew out of control. And the next slide shows an example in a place of Australia where the bunnies went out of control. And uh, this particular area, for example, you'll notice that number one, there's a lot of bunnies, but also there's nothing else. And that's because the rabbits have eaten everything. They've destroyed the ecological environment. They've pushed out other animals, other flora, other fauna, and they've destroyed the ability actually to engage uh, in, for example, agriculture because they've eaten everything. Uh, next slide shows a picture in Southern Australia. That thing in the middle is a rabbit fence. And uh, when I teach this to, to students of virology, uh, we ask them, uh, what side of the fence do you think the rabbits are on? And you can probably guess. They're on the left over there, they've eaten everything. And what you don't see on the right are farmers in their fields gazing balefully at those rabbits that they regard as enemy number one to them and certainly to their livelihood. In fact, it's quite likely that if the rabbits had never been addressed, it may have been that no sheep farming or agriculture in many parts of Australia could have occurred because of the so-called rabbit problem. So as a consequence, um, the Australian government went looking for ways to control rabbits and they actually ended up importing this virus called Myxoma virus and releasing it into the wild of Australia to try and reduce the rabbit populations to a manageable level. And this release happened in about 1950, 1951. And within a couple of years, about 99% of the rabbits in the infected area were, were killed by this virus. It was an astonishing biologic uh, uh, consequence. And as a, as a result, many uh, uh, scientists in Australia started studying this, studying this virus and the host with the idea of trying to understand how do vo viruses and hosts interact with each other genetically. And uh, as a consequence, we know a lot about the coevolution of a virus with a susceptible host by virtue of studying this virus and rabbits in Australia. So when I became a scientist, I got really fascinated in this issue and started studying this virus and, and was became very fascinated in why is this rabbit trapped? Why is this virus trapped in rabbits? And so one of the things we did in the lab was to uh, learn how to grow the virus in rabbit cells. And the other thing we learned how to do is to how to genetically modify the virus in order to study it better. And uh, on the next slide, shows how we actually grow this virus in the lab. These little boxes you see in the back are cells and they've been infected with a virus that we've genetically engineered to express a protein called green fluorescent protein. And you can see those green spots moving around. That's the growth of the virus in these cells. So um, we use this uh, genetically tagged virus in order to follow it, in order to see what it happens uh, in the lab and also to grow it up. So the thing you need to note 
is that those cells in the background could be rabbit cells. And uh, in the early days, that's what we grew the virus in. But actually these cells are not rabbit cells. They're uh, primate cells, they're cancer cells. And one of the things we discovered uh, by accident in the lab about 15, 20 years ago, was if we took this rabbit specific virus and added it to either mouse cancer cells or human cancer cells, it didn't matter. The virus treated those cells the same way it does rabbits. It infects the cells and kills them. And when we got this result, we wondered, because we knew the virus was safe in people and mice, could we use it to actually treat cancer that was in mice or later humans? And that led to about 15 years of study in my lab investigating whether or not we could use this live virus to treat various cancers in animals. And this slide shows an example of us using this virus to treat brain cancer. So what you see here, uh, this is an experiment with mice that have been given human glioblastoma. And if any of you are familiar with brain cancer will know that word. It's a very dangerous human cancer. The treatments are limited. It's very lethal in people. And interestingly, if you take this uh, cancer and put it into the brain of a mouse, it's also lethal to a mouse and it'll kill the mouse. So we wondered after the, the brain, after the glioma was put into a mouse, could we treat the mouse? Could we treat the glioma using this virus? So what we did was we injected with collaborators at the time, a guy named Peter Forsyth, who's at the <clears throat> University of Calgary. He's now the head of neuro-oncology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, by the way, if any of you have heard of that place. But what we did was inject that same virus that expresses that jellyfish protein called green fluorescent protein into the growing glioblastoma in these mice. And you can see at the bottom right, what happened is the virus started growing in the cancer very much the same way it does in rabbits. And it killed those cancer cells, but it didn't hurt the mouse and it didn't hurt the rest of the brain tissue. So all of the mice recovered completely from their glioblastoma. And uh, at the end of experiment, we couldn't find glioblastoma in them anymore. And the virus was gone because it no longer had cells to grow in because in this case, it needed brain cancer cells in order to grow. So this is what really got me into the field of oncolytic virus therapy. And the next slide shows uh, that one of the consequences of that is the spin-off of a new company called Oncomix Therapeutics here from Arizona State University. Um, this company uh, started about a year and a half ago and it is devoted to using this virus, genetically modified versions of it, to treat different classes of human cancer. So Oncomix, the company is actually located in downtown Phoenix. At the moment, today it's, it's in the TGen building in downtown Phoenix, but next month it's moving over to the new Wexford building, uh, also in downtown uh, uh, Phoenix. And uh, I, I'm not sure how many of you know about the Wexford building, but it's a beautiful facility. It will almost assuredly become a hub for biotechnology in Phoenix and in Arizona in the coming years. So uh, Oncomex is very thrilled to be like part of it and to be living there now. And uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we hope to begin our first human trials in the next year or two. Uh, and time will tell kind of how successful we are. But <clears throat> while all this was happening, this is very exciting science and I love doing it. This is what gets me up in the morning. About a year ago, as you all know, something struck us all. Uh, it was called COVID-19. And uh, the arrival of COVID has upturned all of our worlds. Every one of us is, has been impacted by it. Uh, and as a scientist and as a virologist, when uh, this happened, like many, many other scientists, I wondered what could we do? There must be something we can do to help uh, um, this, this conflagration that has hit humankind. So we decided to explore whether or not we could use this virus instead of as an oncolytic, as a vaccine. And our idea was that a number of different vaccines against COVID are based on viruses. And this slide shows you a couple of them. I'm sure many of you have heard of AstraZeneca and the J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson uh, COVID vaccines. 
those vaccines are based on live viruses. In, th in their case, it's adeno a virus called adenovirus that has been engineered to express one of the proteins of SARS-CoV-2, namely the spike or the S protein of SARS-CoV-2. So these vaccines are coming down the pike. And uh, we wondered, could we use our virus to kind of join the, the vaccine gang and maybe come up with a new and an innovative uh, way to tackle this problem? So I'm not an expert in coronaviruses, but fortunately down the hall from me, we do have an expert. Her name is Brenda Hogue. I think she's on the call. And we began a collaboration to ask whether or not we could convert our virus into a COVID vaccine. Next slide. And so our idea was uh, all the other vaccines that are coming in, in onto market are based on one of the proteins of SARS-CoV-2, namely the spike protein or the S protein. And so we call them S only vaccines because they only make the S protein and they only immunize against the spike protein. So we wondered, uh, Brenda and I, along with Masmuda Raman, whether or not we could actually make a vaccine that expresses more of the corona enough to make what's called a virus-like particle or VLP. Um, so on the left, you see uh, the representation of a coronavirus and on the right, you see the representation of a coronavirus VLP or virus-like protein. And they're almost identical. The only difference is the one on the right, the one we're building in the vaccine, does not have the ability to make coronavirus because it doesn't have the RNA genome that you need to make a coronavirus. So we wondered, could we make a myxomavirus vaccine that can immunize against VLPs? And that, in other words, have a broader immune uh, response than just the spike protein alone. And we wondered whether or not that might be important if new variants came along that started evading uh, the, uh, the current vaccines based on spike protein alone. So next slide. So um, th th that's ongoing right now. And uh, so what I thought I would end with you is a little story that happened recently in my family. Uh, it has to do with my uh, grandson, uh, Aaron, uh, who's age five. He's living in Vancouver uh, with his family. And uh, if any of you wonder uh, whether or not coronaviruses have impacted all of us, uh, Aaron was taking a walk in the park a few weeks ago with his dad and he spotted a tree and he grabbed his dad and said, come over and look at this tree. And he brought his dad over there and next slide. And uh, Aaron pointed out that when you look carefully at it, it's a coronavirus tree. So I ask you, uh, if, if you wonder whether or not the coronavirus pandemic has affected all of us, uh, listen to Aaron. He, he is already learned about coronaviruses. His world is already impacted with us, with it. And uh, what we all hope, and I think uh, we all hope sincerely, and I think we will, uh, to defeat this pandemic, uh, we're going to need the, lots of vaccines, we're going to need drugs, we're going to need public health, but we are going to defeat it and we are going to get our lives back again at some point in the future, hopefully not the distant future, uh, but that's what we're all working towards. So this is what I thought I would end my talk with, uh, words of wisdom from my grandson, Aaron. So feel free to ask questions or type them, whatever you guys are interested in doing. So if I can start off, that was a very excellent talk. Thank you very much. I have a couple of specific questions. Yep. One is the live virus in the glioblastoma. How was yep. the live virus delivered? Does it get across the blood-brain barrier? And is the right. blood-brain barrier deficient in a glioblastoma model? Right. Yeah, and so secondly, the, if I okay, just throw in the second, yep. is the virus that you're trying to create for COVID, would it be effective in the variants that we're starting, to, the variant uh, viruses that we're starting to see? Right. So the first question had to do with uh, glioblastoma and the uh, blood brain barrier. So the delivery of oncolytic viruses to cancer is a big deal. It, it is a major topic of concern and it varies from cancer to cancer. Um, so those particular experiments were done with what's called stereotactic in injection. So that was direct intratumoral injection using a needle directly into the tumor bed. Because that is in fact uh, how 
uh, other viruses are being used to treat glioblastoma in clinical trials. So there actually are viruses out there undergoing clinical trials, and they're all being injected uh, stereotactically through a borehole uh, in, in the skull. Sometimes they're done at the same time as surgery, sometimes they're done uh, separately. Uh, but in terms of your question about the blood-brain barrier, there are breaches in the blood-brain barrier, and it is not impossible to deliver an alkalytic virus through the blood-brain barrier for patients that have glioblastoma. But most of the trials ongoing right now have been through the direct route uh, and, but the, the, mat, the manner of delivery, of course, will vary enormously from cancer to cancer. But for glioblastoma, most people think the direct, the direct intratumoral injection is the way to go. So your second question has to do with the new variants. So we're all a bit concerned about uh, the variation uh, of the virus uh, in human population and the way it's evolving. Um, you have to understand that every virus does this uh, when it enters a new host. It starts to co-evolve with the host, it varies, uh, and it gets selected for de depending upon the fittest virus, the virus that, that does the best in the new population. So there is a selection being undergone right now with coronaviruses, uh, particularly in the spike region of, of the coronavirus, uh, to new variants. And at the moment, um, the current vaccines uh, do pretty well against most of them, a little less well against what we call the South African variant, but it is not all or none. There still is protection. And the question is, uh, what's the right way to address that? So what the major uh, um, companies are doing, for example, the messenger RNA companies, so Pfizer and Moderna, are, are the way they're responding is by making new variations of their vaccine that uh, accommodate the new sequences of the new variants. And, and they'll be testing them in the future. And other platforms will probably do the same as well. <clears throat> Our idea, and nobody knows which is the right idea or the best idea right now, but our idea is that by having more proteins of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 in the vaccine, it spreads out what we call the epitope domain. Uh, what that means is it immunizes against more of the virus than just spike alone. So we believe that extra coverage will make it harder for variants to escape it. But uh, we have to prove it. And I think both uh, strategies will be used in the future and time will tell what the right strategy is. Oh, Grant, can I ask you a question? Uh, I've been wondering why, do, do we understand why the myxomatosis virus does not infect normal human cells and why it can in fact infect cancer cells, which are not that much genetically different? Right. And don't you worry that there can be a crossover? So uh, uh, I'll answer your second um, part first. Um, I'm not at all worried about crossover or spillover of this virus into any other species. Because right now, this virus is spread around the world. It's not only in Australia. It's anywhere there are rabbits. It is in the mosquito population. It is in the biting arthropod uh, 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 population. It is everywhere. It has been attempting to leap species uh, through natural mechanisms for over a century and it has failed at every, failed uh, completely. And one of the things that I'm interested in is, is why, uh, uh, scientifically or, or mechanistically, wh why is this virus trapped? So the, the short answer uh, is that it has to do with the nature of the virus itself. So it is a member of a, a virus family called pox viruses, which are large double-stranded DNA viruses. And about half of the genome is devoted to protecting the virus from the immune system. So this is the kind of virus that gets into a, a host and it tackles the immune system. It doesn't run from it, it doesn't hide from it. It tackles it, it faces it head on. And it does that with molecules in the virus that we call immunomodulators. And my lab has been studying those immunomodulators for decades now. And one of the things we've learned is that those immunomodulators that the virus needs 
in order to survive have evolved over time, over millennia, maybe millions of years of coevolution. And all of those molecules have evolved to recognize targets or immune elements in rabbits and nothing else. And so consequently, it has a very powerful repertoire of anti-immune molecules, but it only works in the rabbit. If you put it into a mouse or a human, it is defeated by the natural processes in a mouse or, or a human. So the question is, what's going on in a cancer cell? Why, why doesn't the cancer cell defeat this the same way that a normal human somatic cell does? And part of the reason is uh, related to the essential nature of cancer itself. So most people pay attention to cancer as something that has grown and acquired new characteristics. In other words, the ability to metastasize, the ability to spread, the ability to kill. These are what we call gain of function. So these are things that the cells start doing that they didn't do before they were transformed, before they were cancerous. But the, in addition to gain of function, cancer cells also quietly have what we call loss of function. They give up things as they acquire these characteristics. And one of the things that they give up as part and parcel of becoming cancerous is the ability to, to defend themselves. They lose some of their innate pathways that normally a, a, a regular healthy cell would use to protect itself. A cancer cell gives them up. So you can kind of think of those giving up of features of cancer cells as being an Achilles heel that all cancers have. And that is that it is that set of Achilles heels that the field of oncolytic virotherapy exploits. So all the oncolytic viruses kind of take advantage of that fact that there is an inherent defect in most cancer cells. And that is certainly, certainly the case with this particular virus, but it's true for all the oncolytic viruses. It is an inherent Achilles heel that cancer has. Thank you. Question? Uh, may I ask you, uh, the concern about um, mutants arising and continuing to arise and variants that the antibodies don't recognize as well as the, obviously the, the ancestral, the, 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 the parental form from which the mutants derived. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of points in the question, roughly, roughly how many epitopes that anti, different antibody, the epitope specificities are there on the spike protein or whatever else you were saying, some of the new vaccines might include RNA if there are RNA vaccines for epitopes other than those epitopes on the spike protein. Um, but when we hear that there's a variant in South Africa with five different um, mutations that uh, alter, alter the protein structure or that there's a British variant that doesn't have quite as much, it's still recognized relatively well by by the antibodies produced to the, uh, yep. to, to the, to the primary vaccines. Um, so uh, one wonders whether two or three or four or five variants is a large number in terms of the number of determinants or epitopes on the virus that the antibodies uh, produced to the first vaccines will be targeting themselves, will be targeted. And then, um, well, let, let's leave it that, 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 that let's leave it there. And uh, with a general question as well, how much do we want these sort of questions to be scientifically kind of cutting edge or whatever, or more general? Um, I, I pose that question to the organizers or the hosts in the, in the bigger picture. Well, uh, I'll, 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 I'll comment briefly uh, on the first and, and the second's a little more philosophic and broader. Uh, but, but in terms of your first question, um, Remember, there are two kinds of epitopes uh, in viruses. There are, there are what we call antibody epitopes. They're called B cell epitopes. But there's also cellular epitopes that we call them T cell epitopes. Both are important for immunity. And almost all of the field is focused on the antibody epitopes because antibodies are something that's pretty easy to measure. So uh, we can measure vaccinated people or people who've recovered from COVID uh, whether or not they've got antibodies that recognize the virus or not. T cell epitopes are biologically important, but they're harder to measure. They're a little more techy. Uh, they're, they're a little more restricted to specialized labs and specialized sort of units that can actually measure them. 
But in terms of your general question, how many epitopes are there? There are B cell epitopes, there are T cell epitopes. There are a lot of them. And uh, they vary a little bit according to the, the people. In other words, all people are not genetically identical. So epitopes for what happened for one person are not identical to the epitopes for another person because they have different immune systems. Uh, technically, we call them different HLA uh, uh, repertoires. So what that means uh, is that everyone responds a little bit differently uh, to let's say this virus and makes a different repertoire of antibodies and a different repertoire of cellular T cells. How many do they make? Uh, they make a lot, uh, and, uh, but some of the, the, them are less important than others. So we know a lot about the epitopes of spike, for example, the, 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 the spike like a protein. We know that antibodies that bind to certain parts of spike don't neutralize. In other words, they don't kill the virus. But to other elements of, of spike, those antibodies do neutralize. So we think of them as being more important to the, to the protection against the virus than the, the, the antibodies that, that are not neutralizing. Um, but there are a lot of them and we haven't mapped all of them. My own belief uh, is that the more antigens you have, the broader the, the immune response will be for both B cells and T cells. Uh, but uh, ultimately what really matters is what protects people. What, what, what actually stops people from getting serious COVID. And the truth is that the current vaccines are doing a pretty darn good job of it. Uh, as new variants come down the pike, we might need more uh, uh, variant vaccines in addition to countermand the variant viruses, or we might need vaccines that have a broader uh, immune repertoire, the, like the ones we're working on. Um, time will tell which is which. Uh, and in terms of your last question, the philosophic question, this happens in Mother Nature by in, on planet Earth all the time. Viruses are trying to uh, uh, leap into new species. They're constantly querying every species on the planet, including us. Mostly they fail, uh, but every now and then the oddball virus succeeds. We pay attention to it by virtue of its success. And we learn a little bit about how uh, viruses leap from species to species by paying attention to those oddball quote, quote success stories. Um, so um, coevolution happens to every virus uh, in every host. Uh, we uh, fortunately, coronaviruses mu mutate or vary a little less rapidly than some viruses. Um, but uh, so we believe they're eminently vaccinatable. We believe we'll be able to keep ahead of them. Uh, and I'm very bullish in the ability for us to um, come up with vaccination strategies that work well enough in the future and can be adapted well enough in the future. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful about how this is all going to play out. Uh, there's still maybe some rough days in front of us, but I think ultimately we're going to prevail. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think Michelle so, had a question. Did you want to jump in next? I know you um, put something in the chat. Well, I think it was kind of already answered because I was asking too about jumping species and that just seemed kind of counterintuitive because they've been commingled with, with humans and other species for so long now, taken out of their natural habitat in Iberia. So that was- Right, uh, but, but they have tried, the virus has tried uh, and it's trying all the time. It just, it's failing. Uh, and so some viruses are a little better at others at leaping species. And it's often relates to the, the, the way their biology works. Every virus has got a, its own kind of unique biology. So how many mutations away is this particular virus or this, this group of viruses from making that jump? So uh, uh, myxoma virus to leap into- Myxoma viruses, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just don't see any way of it doing it uh, in um, biologically. There would have to be thousands and thousands of mutations in all the different immunomodulator genes that, that reconfigured literally a hundred genes to stop recognizing rabbit and start recognizing humans or mice. And I, I just don't see any route by which that's possible. 
So I, I think it, it is very, very hard for a virus like this to leap species, much harder than let's say a coronavirus or a flu virus, which leaps species all the time. So uh, you're thinking of throwing a lot of antib uh, antigens in your uh, uh, vaccine platform. And most probably it will produce a lot of antibodies. So yes. have you looked into the, the, the consequence of antibody induced immune response? Yeah, so the, the, w one, of the, one, one of the things that many people have worried about and I worried about uh, a year ago was uh, something called vaccine or antibody in, in induced enhancement of disease. Uh, in other words, whether or not some of the antibodies that, that were inducible or made by vaccination could in fact make things worse rather, rather than protect against disease. So fortunately, uh, I think our experience so far is we've not seen any vaccine enhanced disease in uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is great. Uh, and uh, many of us are kind of breathing a sigh of relief that the vaccines so far have been uh, uh, very safe. Uh, there's been a number, I, I, I mean, any, anyone who's had the vaccine knows that there's a higher incidence of really sore arms or a lousy day after the vaccination, but uh, everyone recovers from it. And I think uh, right now, uh, the, the track record of people that have been vaccinated by any of the platforms or any of the major platforms, not a single one of them at within, let's say two weeks after the vaccination have died of COVID. In other words, the protection against the lethal disease of COVID has been 100% with all the vaccines. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm very, uh, um, I mean, that's fantastic data. And uh, as we get better and better at making vaccines that hopefully will maybe have less side effects, we are on track to, to uh, responding to this pandemic uh, in a way that could not have been predicted a year ago. Thank you. So a quick question on myxoma. You know, um, one of the challenges that people face with cancer therapy is that cancers start to learn how to defeat the, the therapies that come after them. They become resistant to the chemotherapy. So is that something that we have to worry about with the virus or you think that could happen? So in the early days, people did worry about that. Uh, in other words, uh, um, acquired resistance to the therapy. Yeah. And that's actually a big deal with, with uh, small molecule drugs chemotherapy. In fact, all of the target new chemotherapeutics that worked so amazingly at the beginning, uh, um, drug resistant cancer inevitably comes back. And so uh, one of the things we've learned about oncolytic viral therapy is in fact, it's so different than chemotherapy um, that uh, it's unlikely we are going to see what we call what you would call virus resistant cancer. Hmm. Because the, the one, th one of the things we've learned is we do not have to infect all of the cancer cells to completely regress the cancer. Because what the way viral therapy has turned out is you only have to start an infection in some of the cancer cells. And then the, uh, the, what the magic that happens after that is that the immune system comes in, sees the infected cells and generates an immune response to not only the virus, but also antigens that are in the infected cancer cells. So the actual business end of the regression is the immune response to diverse uh, epitopes, cancer antigens. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether or not the virus develop or, or the, the cell develops resistant to the uh, virus at that point. What matters is the quality of the immune response that was generated by the first infection. Very so cool. We don't think it's going to be a big problem. Resistance like that is going to be a big problem with viral therapy, the way it is with, let's say, chemotherapy. Got it. Well, I think we need. We may want to move on to the next phase of the evening here. I see we've been. Bit, we have our our next guest is here. So, um, cheers, Sarah, everyone. Are you going to introduce her, or am I doing that? I guess I'm doing it. All right. So, uh, we have um, Chef. Ruth, um, I think she pronounces her name Q3L, and she's going to do a demonstration for how to make um, mushroom duxelles turnovers. So we're going to turn it over to her, and we're, uh, this is the recipe that you all received with your invitation. Thanks, Grant. 
Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And it was so wonderful to listen to you, Grant, and uh, about your research and everything. This is, that's pretty big. It's very exciting. Um, so here we are today. We have a short segment about how to make mushroom duck cell. Um, as you can see here with the you know, the magic of TV, we have our, some mushroom duck cell appetizers ready to go. These are a lovely little bite to get your party started. They're very nice as a past hors d'oeuvre. Um, I love them because it's in a rustic style. It's a classic, um, you know, classic flavor profile that goes well with any beverage. Um, personally, I would pair it with a red burgundy. Also, I think my friend, Dr. Monk would as well. We're big fans of red burgundy here. We could go with a white burgundy as well. Also, um, I put a little hint of truffle oil in them and truffle and a wine from Piemonte would be absolutely delicious, like a, a lovely Barolo. So, um, but we would have to do this another time for me to go into the wine and the food together because that's my true passion. <laughs> so, okay, from there, I have my ingredients, my mise en place all together. I'm gonna alter my camera here a little bit so I can kind of show you. So the mushrooms to begin, they're chopped finely. Let's see, there we go. Um, and what I have is them in the recipe, you'll notice that it was to drain them in cheesecloth. And what this does is with, like help draw out all the moisture. If you don't have cheesecloth, you can use a nice a little a linen towel. I wouldn't go for a terry cloth as in the fuzzes could get on your vegetables. But the mushrooms are very porous vegetable um, and they have a lot of water content. So it's very important to draw out all the water before you begin cooking them. Um, also, one thing with cooking mushrooms you'll want to know, um, especially if you're cooking them with shallots or garlic, you want to begin the cooking process first because of all that moisture, they take longer to cook and to draw all that moisture out because you don't want runny, you don't want a runny filling for our puff pastries here. Um, also, salt, when you add salt to season them, that also extracts water. So you would want to add your salt at the beginning as well so it could cook in and all that moisture comes out together. Here's our shallot, that's small dice. We want everything about the same size for this filling. Um, a classic mushroom duck cell is used in the beef wellington and they kind of, usually it's a little more fine as it chopped finer. Um, it would be more of like a paste that would be used in a beef wellington. Okay, so here's our chopped thyme. And we used butter, a little, I chose to use white wine. I had a cheap Chardonnay around. I wouldn't spend more than $10 for cooking wine. Um, sherry would be nice. You could even use a little brandy if you wanted to. And this is the filling. This is what our desired look is. So there's a touch, it's just so lovely. So savory, beautiful, one of my favorites. So what I'm going to do here is show you kind of how to work the puff pastry because that could be the trickiest part, I believe. So let me just adjust here a little bit. Now I'm going too fast. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'll keep going here. Okay, so here's a lovely sheet puff pastry. What you wanna do, you wanna be a little gentle with it and we're not gonna roll it out much but I'm going to dust my counter just to make sure it doesn't stick. Now we want to, like I said, we just want to stretch it a little bit just to kind of wake it up, if you will. And one important thing when you're rolling with puff pastry, you want to keep it even. So everything you do to one side, you're going to want to do to the other side, just like that. I'm going to stretch it this way a little bit, and this way, and there we are. I think um, this puff paste or this um, appetizer is just very user friendly because as you can see, they don't have to be perfect, but they are delicious no matter what they look like. Just don't burn them. That's the only thing. That's what timers are for. Okay, now we're gonna take the puff pastry here and I'm going to cut it into thirds with my um, pizza roller here. So just like that. Now, one of my little tricks I love to use, this is a little bit of mayonnaise. What we're gonna do is spread the mayonnaise on each of our three pieces here. What this does is it helps, you know, keep our puff pastry um, from drying out 
And it also helps our goodies stick together. So when we fold them over, we don't lose all our goodies together. So here we are, just smearing this on nice and even. Would you recommend a substitute for people who aren't mayonnaise friendly? Um, I mean, they make a veganaise, which is the same substance, you know, same style. Maybe um, you could do a little goat cheese or cream cheese if it was whipped and just easily spreadable. Um, I think that would be the best thing. So there we are, just nice, a pretty thin layer. We're just really using it for everything to stick. Okay, now I have my shredded Gruyere. Add this in, just sprinkle it all around on top of our mayonnaise spread. The more cheese, the better in my opinion. I think that looks good there. Okay. Now we'll take our mushrooms and add them. Mushroom mix here. We're gonna divide this amongst the three as well. So just kind of on one side, you wanna keep it because we're gonna fold our puff pastry. Um, I guess you could say hot dog style. Okay, now I'm gonna take my egg wash. Egg wash is one full egg beaten with a little bit of water, just enough to make it runny and pliable and you wanna beat it so that um, everything combines well. We're gonna kind of brush this on our edges first here so we can get them to stick. But like I said, it's okay if they don't stick perfectly, they will, some of them will spill out a little bit but it's fun when you see all this, the stuff goozing out because then you know that it's really delicious. Okay, so we're gonna take and fold these hot dog style, like I said. So long ways to long ways, kind of press it a little bit. Do that with all three. Now I kind of have some ends here without anything in them. So I'm just gonna trim those off so that nobody gets disappointed picking up thinking they have something delicious with nothing in it. That's the worst. Okay, like that. Okay, now I love to demonstrate this, the cutting technique. So turnovers are typically a triangle size. So we have our flat edge here. I'm just gonna make cut them into triangles. So then we will cut along this other flat edge just like that. And voila. Now we'll repeat. Okay, now we will transfer these to our parchment lined sheet pan. Our oven is at 400 degrees. Chef Ruth, is there anything you need to do to seal these or was that one egg wash, was that sufficient? The egg wash should be sufficient as well as, you know, the, the mayonnaise too, that helps with that. Okay. But these, um, you know, I like to keep them rustic looking and, 
and like that. So um, I don't like to press them close with the fork. I feel, I feel like, you know, I mean, that is a classic way to do things, but we're keeping this easy. So everybody, nobody's intimidated by this delicious recipe. And once you taste it, you'll realize it tastes complex, but it's so easy. Okay, now we have these on our tea pan. It's okay if they won't grow too much, just upwards. Now we brush everything with the egg wash and that's how we get the beautiful coloring. Now, some of these, if you wanted to, you could sprinkle if you had like some special finishing salts, like a black truffle salt, that would be nice. We have some extra chopped herbs, so we could sprinkle those on top. We could sprinkle a little bit of our cheese on top as well. Um, if you're doing multiple fillings, it would be fun to distinguish them. Um, say you put prosciutto and um, Dijon and Italian cheeses in it, then maybe you'd want to sprinkle some oregano on top or some cheeses, you know, with these mushrooms, I would love to sprinkle some herbs on top. As a matter of fact, I think I will. I also do a filling with caramelized onion and goat cheese. There. We're salivating. Just like that. Okay, now I recommend always setting, so it's about a 20 minute cook time. Definitely set your timer for um, 10 minutes and rotate 10 minutes because I'm sure we've all learned that no oven cooks evenly. So just set you up for success. Of course, if you have any questions on any step of this, you can always reach out to me via email. And also, I would like to invite you, I do cooking lessons about once a month. I'll be doing one on March 11th, um, learning how to use your cast iron skillet and we're, we're gonna be making fajitas. So if that interests you all, I would love to invite you. Send me your email and I will add you to my mailing list and you can get, um, it would be just kind of like you receive this recipe card with the list of ingredients and your equipment list. And then we all cook together and it's a lot of fun. So here we have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. I wish we were all enjoying it look them. easy. <laughs> I wish we were all enjoying them together. Yeah, but maybe, you know, over. hopefully soon in the near future we could do this all together. <laughs> yes, we will. We will. You made it look easy. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, well, I'm um it's my pleasure to uh, remind you we have another one of these coming up. Uh, and you're looking at, at the uh, at the smile of Tim Long, one of our newest uh, center directors at Biodesign. Uh, Tim is thinking about sustainability of the planet and how to make polymers out of uh, friendly uh, uh, parts and, and th things that break down in time. And so he's gonna be talking about alter alternatives to keeping people on the planet safe. And that will be on April 6th. So the same kind of uh, a plan for that we're doing now at, at, from six to 7 p.m. So please um, uh, RSVP at that number. Uh, and yeah, the details are here. And then we also have, um, is it a, a cocktail we're having next? It looks like it's a cocktail when we're doing Yes, it. yes. Okay, so we'll be teaching how to do a cocktail on the next one. All right, so, um, and with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Elizabeth Munkal and uh, she's gonna have a couple things to say. Thanks, Josh. Uh, as Josh mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Munkel, and I have the great pleasure of working with the Biodesign Institute on behalf of the ASU Foundation. Tonight, you got a glimpse of the amazing work taking place every day at Biodesign. We would love for you to join us in making this work possible. One way to accomplish this is to join our Pioneer Circle. The Pioneer Circle is comprised of science enthusiasts, curious knowledge seekers, and committed philanthropic supporters who invest in biodesign's groundbreaking research. Your gift of $1,000 or more annually empowers our teams to take on the most pressing challenges to our health and environment. Philanthropy plays a unique and vital role in our work by allowing our researchers to explore new and untested frontiers of disease detection, drug therapy, and sustainable materials. 
To learn more or to join, please contact me or visit the website just added in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, so looking forward to seeing all of you um, next month, uh, roughly about uh, one month from now um, at our next event with Tim Long. I hope everybody stays safe and remains healthy. Um, take care, everyone. Yay, and thank you, Grant. Fantastic. Thanks, Grant. Yep. And Jeff Ruth, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you again, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye all. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.